Welcome to the meeting room at Global TV Talk Show, a broadcast service of globalbusinessnews.net. Now, here's your host, Ed Cohen. Hi, it's Ed Cohen in San Diego, California, and this is Global TV Talk Show, a service of globalbusinessnews.net. Go and visit globalbusinessnews.net. We've been active on the web since uh, around 2003. Uh, An old friend of mine from Intel helped me build the site. Actually him, but I told him what to do. Anyway, we have received since that time, a long time ago, a lifetime ago, uh, according to Google Analytics, over 1.2 million audience page views. According to Google Analytics, if we can believe all that, uh, about 70% are in North America and South America, Latin America, and about 15 to 20% in Europe, uh, a little less than that, Asia Pacific, and minuscule Middle East and Africa was seeking to grow that, of course. Today's show is about Global 21. What's happening next? We're going to have a vaccine I've already volunteered with my doctor to, because I'm old, um, I'm critical. And so they got to jab me as soon as possible right here. (laughs) And uh, as soon as I do that, I'm going to start producing meetings again, and hopefully others will do it too. (laughs) So uh, with us is a group here, uh, people who mostly know each other, and I don't know JD and he doesn't know me but from the good offices of K Cut we're introduced and so JD please introduce yourself uh I know you're with HRCI which is the accreditation educational thing in Washington uh and we really would like all our visitors uh to our site and to this show to get some kind of credit for the education that they're going to derive. But I'm going to leave that up to you. We're just going to be good teachers here. JT, welcome to Global TV. Hopefully you you like it enough to want to come back and do more. Why don't you quickly introduce yourself and what your role is and tell us about HRCI today. Sure. Thank you. Thank you for uh, for the opportunity. Uh, My name is JD Nomdedeo. I'm Director of International Business Development and Partnerships at uh, the HR Certification Institute, HRCI. We are, as you mentioned, the uh, uh, certification uh, programs are recognized uh, around the world. Uh, For over 40 years, we have certified over half a million HR professionals. And during that time, we've seen uh, the significant increase of uh, demand for our certifications as HR becomes one of the most uh, essential ways to uh, manage workforce uh, worldwide. And uh, in the last year with the pandemic, we've seen a a significant increase in interest for uh, learning, learning online. We have transitioned uh, pretty much everything that we do online now. And we expect in 2021 to continue that sort of uh, digital learning being the uh, than the new normal. So if people out there in the world uh, wanted to get credit for this education or some other course somewhere else, um, what do they do? Do they write you? So as part of the certification programs, every three years, uh, every um, professional who's certified needs to go through the process of recertification. In order to recertify, they need to accumulate a certain number of uh, credit hours. And those credit hours can be received through uh, things that you do in your normal everyday work uh, through attending conferences or through uh, attending uh, webinars that are informative about the HR profession. So on our website, we have a directory of uh, thousands of activities that HR professionals can have access to that are recognized already for recertification credits. And we count with uh, um, thousands of, of um providers of this type of um, content in HR that help uh, the professionals to be up to date with everything that is changing in in HR. That's great. Okay, so how is this different from uh, SHRM? Are are you tied in or are you not? So uh, in the early ages of um, HRCI, we were under the umbrella of SHRM. Uh, SHRM was, uh, in a sense, the way that we would communicate with uh, the HR professionals. We were the certification body. We continue to do what we've been doing for 40 years. So nothing has changed for us in the in terms of what we do and what we offer. Uh, and, and we continue to just uh, 
keeping in touch with what the HR professionals want and they need uh, using best practices and inviting subject matter experts to build our certifications and to make sure that they're relevant. And we expect that, of course, uh, with everything that is changing in the upcoming years, our certifications are going to have to adjust very much to what that new normal is with, uh, um, I guess, this time of the year, everybody's doing uh, performance evaluations. How is that going to work? Uh, and the way that uh, we address the type of issues uh, definitely affects the HR profession. So we'll, we'll transition that into our exams and our certifications to make sure that our certifications uh, remain relevant. So speaking about performance evaluation, uh, I want you all to be super me and this program, but not publicly. <laughs> Just send me a message and, uh, and I'll read it. So this would not be possible without Kay. Thank you so much for wanting to do this. And, and you know, you and I have known each other a lifetime and I really appreciate this continuation. Kay, so you're uh, with uh, Silk Relo. What yes. a great name. I love your logo. Yes. And, and tell us uh, how that relates to Asian Tigers. Yeah, so I'm uh, Kay Kud. I'm the CEO for Silk Relo. Um, I've been with the Asian Tigers group for 12 years. I can say that I am still part of that Asian Tigers family or suite of businesses. Uh, but in the uh, beginning of this year, 1120, we'd made a strategic decision in our earlier board meetings that we we recognize that Asian Tigers has such a strong brand and identity with a tiger face, our, our yellow and, and black. And, and speaking with our, our clients and customers, they first thought about household goods. So we made the decision to return the tigers to all things moving and their DNA for the moving services. Uh, the logo remains the same and we have retired the name mobility. So if you're looking for pure play household goods, Asian tigers. And for Silk Relo, it's all things relocation. Um, and now for that, us, the, we are not a relocation management company that wants to do expense administration or assignment management. We're focused on the visa immigration, the destination services. And if customers, and this is in country with a footprint in Asia, and I'll say Asia proper. So it's from Myanmar to Japan, China down to Indonesia and the Philippines. If they're looking for a regional opportunity that also includes household goods with our account management, we can include that in leveraging our Asian Tigers network. So it gives our clients more choice and it also gives us the ability to really target our marketing to the, our clients and our client and prospects needs. So I also wanted to just reference, and this is where, um, and thank you JD for, for joining. I'm also on the board for HRCI and responsible for uh, HRCI's governance committee. So with that, uh, Ed, when, while, while you and I were chatting about this session and recognizing about talent and upskilling, you know, uh, as we look at developing our teams, there's a lot of resources that we have technical skills, and especially as we look to iterate and change for 2021, um, that we have our discipline related to the relocation services that we would educate and train internally. But there are so many um, opportunities for developmental growth for our team members that we look to an organization like HRCI to help us with content and also certification products. So I'm a GPHR, that is one of HRCI's um, uh, certifications. Uh, and especially at the moment related to diversity, equality and inclusion and the education and growth for our team members, I don't have resource material that I have created. I look to HRCI's learning and upskill opportunities uh, to, to provide that to our team members. So I just wanted to give you context of, you know, what my thought was as, as bringing JD to the table for you today in this conversation. Thank you. Now I want to introduce uh, to our audience in the world, Beverly Sun, who is uh, in Hong Kong. Hi, Beverly. Thank you for doing Hi. this. Hi. Good evening, everyone. If I'm a little scratchy, it's 1130 here. So forgive me. <laughs> Um, we are Asia Pacific Properties. We are a real estate based organization focused on corporate real estate and helping families move and transition into Hong Kong. Um, we actually pioneered relocation services in 1985, not realizing that it was an industry. It was really more of a dedication to helping families who were stressed, who weren't familiar with the culture and who needed much more support in integrating into the community. 
1995, we established ourselves in China where we have three offices and, and service at least 20 cities throughout and have over the years brought in very large and very small groups. And the most exciting part about this is that you really see change and you offer people a different experience. And when they leave Asia, they leave as different and more people I mean, and through their experience, they, they leave differently. Um, and are quite enriched. So that has always been rewarding for me personally and professionally for my colleagues to share the passion. This year, of course, instead of real estate, we've been doing COVID state um, <laughs> and have developed really since January a crisis management team in our offices, handling all the various nuances of, of the disease and and the difficulties that people have had entering and exiting. Uh, and without the support, it has really, uh, we've come across so many people who have really been stressed in distress and in very, very, I would say precarious situations. So I could only encourage that, that we really continue because I, I do believe that this will certainly be um, a concern through next year as well. So so give us a quick insight on Singapore as well. Singapore as well. I think Singapore has also um, been a very interesting community in as much as it, it, through the initial, they really had certain issues as had Hong Kong, but have actually done an excellent job of being able to contain uh, COVID as this, we're speaking about COVID-19. And in fact, until a week ago, we should have had a bubble between Singapore and Hong Kong because both cities have done so well in maintaining um, the COVID and without a lockdown, by the way, we've just take, taken precautions through mass, physical distancing. I don't like to say social distancing. I think social distancing, socializing is extremely important in Asian cultures. So I don't want to de take that away from something that's so critical for not only our survival, but for our growth and, and, and for the continuity of the society. So physical distancing has been very important for both these cities. And uh, unfortunately, over the last week, we were now have hit a fourth wave. So this bubble will be on hold until January. Having said that, uh, we have now I think today in Hong Kong, we had about a hundred cases and in other cities around the world, they speak about 6,000, 10,000. So relative to other communities, I would say, um, whilst alarming for us, it's really very moderate. From so, so, so do you get involved in, in uh, other places such as Kuala Lumpur or Taiwan? India, Taiwan as yeah. well. Yes, and China, of course, is, is of great interest to us, given that we have our offices and have been supporting families who have been fortunate enough to come back to join their, their um, spouses. Very interesting. Uh, very quickly, I want to introduce again John Schultz, uh, who's one of our sponsors, of course, but um, he worked and lived in Asia for many years. John, why don't you uh, explain a little bit? Thanks, Ed, and, and good day to everyone. Good evening to you, Beverly. Um, Kay, I'm a, a very satisfied customer of Asian Tigers. Uh, I spent six years in Japan and five years in South Korea, and Asian Tigers moved us both times. So both, you know, back, actually three times, back and forth. So great company, Asian Tigers. Um, International Auto Source is a 25-year-old company, uh, and we have 50,000 satisfied customers around the globe. What we do is when people are uh, sent on assignment to a country, uh, we assist them with getting into a new vehicle. So if you have assignees, for example, that are coming to the United States, and you, uh, they, they quickly realize they'll need a new vehicle, they go into a dealership, and the dealer says, you don't have a credit history. You don't have an identification number or social security number. I'll be happy to sell you a car. Just write me a check for $40,000. What we do is provide financing for the expats moving to the countries 
And instead of a $40,000 check, they write a $4,000 check, pay monthly. At the end of their assignment, if they purchase the vehicle, they can take it with them and they go back to their home country. Or if they lease it, they just turn it back in to, uh, to the dealer and they return to their home country. So we can assist with purchase, lease, and we also have a global rental operation that's been available in over 150 countries for assignments that are 12 months or less. And um, the monthly fee includes all insurance and it includes a multiple driver option. So when Ed does these kinds of uh, programs, uh, as director of global business development for my company, I'm very interested in listening and hearing about what's going to happen around the world in the mobility space in 2021. And I'm also uh, very interested in, in finding new partners that we can work with around the world. Happy to uh, provide a vehicle. Pre, with, this wouldn't happen without you. And so good evening to you. It's uh, now, what, about 9 p.m. there in, in Bangalore? Yes, it's about 8.51. And, well, uh, well, you look wonderful, and thank you for your effervescence this late in your day. I really appreciate it. Thank you so much, Ed. Uh, really uh, honored to be part of this panel uh, today and seeing so many friendly faces that uh, I have worked with in the past. So um, I work for a global mobility company called Helma International. Uh, we, very much like Beverly and Kay, uh, and Carla's company as well. We provide uh, immigration, relocation, compensation and benefit uh, assistance to our clients. So we have four offices around the world in France, Germany, China, and I work out of the India office. In countries where we don't have our presence and if our clients need services in those countries, that's where my role comes into play uh, I manage strategic partnerships and I have to find partners around the globe who can assist our clients. Um, over and above that, and since this is about upskilling and training uh, this session, uh, my responsibilities include not only training my colleagues in-house uh, on business processes, um, but I also offer cross-cultural training for assignees of our clients, for partners who are going to receive and work with those assignees, and for my colleagues who are going to work with those assignees. Um, as for Helma India, I'm actively involved in the onboarding process of our uh, new joinees. Now, I think what JD mentioned, and it's so true with the pandemic, uh, there was a lot of soul searching, I think people did. Uh, they started questioning about where their life is going. And I think uh, learning new skills, uh, one, because there was a time, two, uh, there was a need because the market was so, um, so fluid and flux, we needed to adapt quickly. And three, I think uh, there was, the, the employers felt that there was a need to keep employees motivated. So I think in regards to retention, motivation, and to increase productivity, what Helma did is that we created a space for our stakeholders to be trained. For, for our in-house employees, uh, we set up, we helped them join the URA MIM certification program that is managing international mobility uh, so that they are more, uh, you know, they get trained for the job that they are performing. We also did uh, learning during lunches where we did knowledge sharing within our offices. You know, there are uh, specialists within our company and they told us what they were doing. So that was knowledge sharing, which was very helpful. And we also did business process training because suddenly we all found ourselves at home and we had to adapt to a new working scenario. For our clients, we did something called, uh, you know, we set up webinars to understand what is the uh, immigration status in different countries that they are that they are that are their hubs, 
and what are the choices available to them given that the pandemic is ongoing so these were the things that we put in place in the last 6 months well thank you very much so i i want to uh come back to you um after uh, a, a quick uh, video show we're going to do. Uh, but um, you and Studi introduced me to your design thinking guy. And, you know, I'm still using that video because it's brilliant. Uh, it's, it's on the uh, uh, website, Global Business News. But um, so I want to do a deep dive with you as it relates to upskilling and reskilling and reinventing. The, the processes and the thinking behind design thinking, sort of creative process, okay? Okay, let's go to Carla. So I'm very familiar with Premier and uh, Rita and Sean for a lifetime. And this is, uh, I think, our first time meeting. So welcome, Carla. Thank you so much, Ed. So I am, as I was mentioning earlier, I am the Partner Development and Branding Manager for Premier Destination Services. We offer immigration and destination services throughout Latin America and the Caribbean. We cover 30 countries and over 70 cities. Um, we have five offices, uh, the, the US office, Mexico, Chile, Colombia, and I'm missing one, Brazil. <laughs> I was missing Brazil. Um, so we have five offices and we manage everything, everything, everything that is needed for clients in all over the world, everything in the region. And we like to consider ourselves the experts on, on Latin region. So, uh... As I mentioned, I'm familiar with Premier. They have been involved in our meetings in Mexico and also Brazil. And uh, I think Panama also, but I don't remember right now. So, Carla, what is your role? Partner Development and Branding Manager. Okay. And what does that mean? That means that I am in charge of all the clients, the current clients, the relationships, the new clients, um, the new strategics, uh, the new uh, strategies for, for developing new businesses, you know, to bring more people aboard, um, on board to the, to the company. Um, I'm also in charge of all the marketing and all the branding and all, all the getting the name out in the industry, you know, uh, beyond the region. Uh, but getting the name out and building and basically turning the world purple because that's our that's our color. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so a uh, message to producer Paul uh, in about three or four minutes. Let's run the uh, commercial block. Uh, JD, before we do that, so this is your first time here. I hope you stick with us for the rest of the show. But uh, so what have you seen so far that intrigues you? I know it's just another video show or another Zoom, but you know we try to make it interesting because of the mix and because of the uh, effervescence of our guests themselves. And they're, they're all smart people. So uh, yeah, I'm pitching you. Please give us credit, <laughs> not credit, but HRCI credit for the listeners out there and the participants. We're working that for sure. Um, oh, cool. I, I, I will say uh, it's interesting listening to what everybody has to say in different locations, different places. Uh, and in a way, what I'm getting, uh, and this has been uh, several months that, I, that I've been realizing because in my daily interaction with people over, all over the world, I see the same thing, which is we thought that globalization was dead. And it wasn't dead. It was somehow dormant, or at least for some of us, it was still very much alive. And then the world uh, has uh, reunified in this uh, experience with the pandemic that we're all experiencing the same type of thing. So it's kind of bringing this uh, benchmark again of in order to uh, be professional, to interact with the uh, with the rest of the world, we have to come with a, a certain uh, rules that we're all going to have to um, um, work with. And I see that happening all over again. So I don't know if this is globalization 2.0 that is about to begin uh, a totally different uh, uh, sunrise for all of us in, in this global world. But uh, it definitely seems that um, <clears throat> we, are, we are very much where we used to be in the late 90s, early 2000s. Interesting, isn't it? A great perspective from each of you. Paul, let's run the videos. Uh, the first one you'll see is about continuing education for expat kids and others around the world through first class online education. Okay, Paul.
And now a word from our co-sponsors. You know, our programs wouldn't happen without the wonderful support of our advertisers. Here they are. Something that's really neat is that the Bridge School partners with various organizations to provide learning for their students. For example, we partner with a major ballet company and we are able to enroll several of their students into our school. So now not only is the student able to participate in a school and have a seamless transition while they're very active in their ballet career, but now they have um, other dancers that are with them that are doing some of the same courses. So it's almost becoming a, a camaraderie where they're taking similar courses, they're working together on their ballet, and really being able to form this great partnership with these organizations to provide a needed service. A lot of times um, there are student athletes who will spend hours and hours at the gym or um, at the, the basketball courts, wherever it is. And if they're attending a traditional school, they're in school from eight to three. They get a quick snack and then they're at the gym for three to four hours in the evening. Coming to us and having that partnership, they're able to break that up throughout the day. They can have a morning practice, get some schooling in, have an afternoon practice, finish their schooling in the evening. So there's that flexibility. And additionally, if there are tournaments or performances, it's fantastic because if there's a week where they have shows straight through, they can take that week off of learning and then pick back up when they're done. So it offers this this great flexibility. And for the program owners of these sports leagues, it is a win-win situation for them because they see this need. They see this need that their students need to make sure that they are obtaining the grades necessary to be successful adults in, in our country and in other countries. But it provides them an environment where they can be successful at both. This episode from the Meeting Room of Global TV Talk Show is brought to you by The Bridge School, the accredited international online private school of choice at bridgek12.org Porch Light Rental and Destination Services Reduce your renter lump sum or managed relocation costs Visit them at porchlightrental.com Cube Monk, featuring the world's first smart cube Track your goods with our advanced GPS system Welcome to the future of moving and relocation at cubemonk.com. Primestone Partners, featuring corporate, government, and developer housing solutions, as well as senior level advisory services. Find them at primestonepartners.com. And by airs.com. With our full range of services, we can help design and manage your international relocation. Find us at airs.com. Insured Nomads provides protection and peace of mind with health insurance, travel insurance, group, or tailored insurance for the globally mobile. Visit us at insurednomads.com. And by International Auto Source. We are the vehicle experts for expats, featuring all major brands of automobiles with flexible solutions and financing. On the web at intlauto.com. Hi, my name is Christine. I'm a nurse from the Philippines and I got to know IAS through Worldwide Health Staff Solutions and I want to thank IAS, especially to Matthew for helping me get my car um, stress-free, headache-free and so I just want to show you the car that I got. So it's a RAV4 XLE 2020. As an expat moving to the USA, relocating is exciting, but it can also be stressful. 
Getting a car, truck, or SUV for personal transportation is usually a high priority. That's where International Auto Source comes in. We make getting the vehicle you want for your work assignment or academic program easy, so you're ready to drive when you arrive. Our product specialists have helped over 50,000 expatriates with their personal transportation needs, making us the largest international auto retailer in the world. International Auto Source gives you flexible payment options to buy, lease, or rent a vehicle from the world's leading auto brands, arrange financing on a purchase or lease without a U.S. credit history, social security number, or driving record, get full insurance coverage, and get approved easily through our low-rate factory-backed financing programs. And because we're an authorized distributor of the world's leading automotive brands, our no-haggle prices are competitive, and the buying experience is hassle-free. We'll even guarantee your new vehicle will be ready the day you arrive. With over 20 years of experience in the global community, we are the vehicle experts for expats. We are International Auto Source. So I wanted you to uh, see all that, and I thank you for hanging in there. As you could see, it's slick, and those are expensive <laughs> PR devices that you just saw, and uh, it it works. Um, and we're able, I'm able to say that in the new year we're going to have additional sponsors, um, and we haven't lost any yet. So, hey. Thank you. So, um, Pre, about design thinking and application to relocation, mobility, business management. Tell us a little bit about design thinking. Uh, a, a lot of us have heard of it and something about putting little pieces of paper on a wall or something. So what's that all about and how can you learn from that? Okay. So design thinking, and to begin with, I must put a disclaimer that I'm a novice in this field. Uh, <laughs> global mobility is my field. Design thinking is something that I learned uh, during the pandemic. And we have tried to use it um, to enhance our services or to solve our problems. So what is design thinking? It is finding a creative solution to a problem. And for that, there are usually five steps. So I will just give you an example of what we have done at Helma. So during the pandemic, one of the things that uh, happened with almost all clients, all our clients, is that they couldn't move people. They, either they couldn't bring them back home, or if there were projects that, were, uh, that had started, they couldn't send the assignees on site for those projects. So we needed to find a solution. And this is something that we heard again and again from our clients. How do we move people? Because this is global mobility and the mobility had come to a standstill. So we were the first step in design thinking is to empathize, understand who your client is and what do they need? So we defined the problem. The problem was that there is a project ongoing, but they are unable to get the staff or resources to that project to that location in that country. So what are the possible solutions? So let's say within Europe, uh, there is a, within, within the Schengen countries or the EU countries, you can uh, move resources within one country if they have a blue card or on a Van der Elst visa. So we were trying to find uh, short-term solutions for our client. But now we have come to the second lockdown in Europe and we need to have a long-term plan. So we sat down and the third step, let's say of design thinking is to ideate. So we sat down and did a brainstorming. How can we help our clients, you know, see through this pandemic while the projects on site are not impacted because of a lack of resources. And then we came up with a solution that perhaps what we can do as an interim, interim solution is to find local talent who can perform that work so that there is no requirement for mobility or there is no uh, impact if, for example, like between Hong Kong and Singapore, uh, the travel bubble has now been stopped. So everybody was ready to move. And then now that has 
uh, shut down. And the same thing is happening in Europe. So we have come up, for example, with a package uh, that we are planning to propose to our clients, which is we are going to assist them with local recruitment and uh, uh, you know, uh, payrolling of local talent. And the next step, uh, again, to go back to design thinking is prototype and testing. So wish us luck, uh, Ed, that when we test this package, new package that we have developed for our clients and we are going to launch it, that it goes well, because I think we have used all the steps of design thinking to come up with a creative solution to a problem uh, where we don't have control because we don't know how governments will uh, um, uh, will react to uh, the changing impact of the pandemic. So yeah. there you go. Uh, Thank you. Just an example of how we have used design thinking. JD, what do you think of design thinking? So it's actually a concept that I that I heard uh, quite recently. I'm still trying to get familiar with it, but I think it kind of goes back to what I was saying that there's going to be a new set set of uh, uh, rules that we're all going to have to understand and internalize and reflect in the way that we work together. And I I do think that design thinking is getting to that point that all companies and in, in the way that we interact globally is getting to that point so that everybody approaches how to work together with the same with the same goals. Yeah, Beverly. Well, I think the design thinking, you know, is really uh, very interesting because uh, certainly we're really speaking about new processes, new ideas, new concepts in an in, in industry that was very much, I think, established with certain standard operating procedures. And in, in these days, you really must be creative and you, there always has to be the contingent because most of these are crisis, crisis intervention and crises. So to be able to train your staff to handle with competency and calmness and have external resources available, um, it requires just being extremely knowledgeable of current events and these, these events change day by day. So I think the agility of thinking um, without judgment and the objectivity that you put into uh, design thinking is extremely important because we're dealing with people. Yeah, Carla, in Latin America, is design thinking the rage? Everything works a little bit different in Latin America. That's just a statement. <laughs> but that being said, for sure, I think that when <laughs> one of the things that that we like to, or that we have accomplished, is we already had a different way to approach services and the teams and the onboarding and everything because we covered that many, that many cities, that many, like the region is so wide that we cover, right? However, I think that design thinking at the moment is this creative way to, to offer new solutions, to offer new services, to, to have a new way to, to assist not only the families, which is the thing that we do for sure, but also the team members, how to engage them, how to, how to make them, develop in a different sense, how to assist the partners in a better way, how to, how to creatively make a difference, not only for our families, but also for, for everyone involved in the process. So is, is, are things done differently in Brazil as opposed to Mexico City? Yes and no, because we need to, for sure, we need to, to take into account the local differences Right? and the, the, the difference between the approaches, the cultures, the, the, the way that we solve things um, as people in different countries. However, we do try to standardize a little bit the, the, the processes, the, uh, the, the ways to do things, at least for us as a company, instead of um, we try to, to use the global mindset and, and apply it to the locals, trying to, to, to work as a bridge right, between what it's done in other regions and apply it to the locals. Very interesting. Uh, I want to use this as an opportunity to plug our Brazil meeting, uh, which our teleconference will focus on Brazil, and it's going to be on December 14 at 3 p.m. Brazil time, all right? And Brazil time is uh, two hours uh, beyond New York, five hours from here in California. Um, and I'll send you the stuff about that, Carla, so you could uh, think about that. 
Um, Thank you. Yeah, uh, we're partnering with Brazil Talks and uh, also uh, Juliana Ruiz and, and, and others. Also Ernst & Young is gonna be involved in that. Um, so we wanna talk about design thinking, of course, and what's going on there. So um, uh, Kay, uh, you, you mentioned about the split or the uh, reinventing of, uh, uh, and, the, uh, and the, the formation of Silk Relo uh, within and apart at the same right. time from Asian Tigers. So did you use design thinking and didn't know it? Um, I could say yes in many ways. And I, I would also say, you know, uh, design thinking and we have, uh, you know, there's, there's certain tools and labels and also processes, right? So again, what design thinking may have and it, it's, you know, in our life as human beings, we have change all the time. And, you know, there's sometimes that it's, it's constructed and there's other times that I could say we, it, it's more an epiphany that, uh, of what it might be. Um, in our board meetings, I would say there was an element of, of design thinking around where we recognized our, who we are. And I, I always reference, who do we want to be when we grow up? Um, you know, as, as you, you continue on your trajectory for business and recognizing, you know, uh, just what the market recognized. And, and you could throw a lot of effort and energy at uh, getting our clients that know. And, and I'll say, John, thank you for your, your shout out of comment for Asian Tigers. But as you're thinking about Asian Tigers, you know, it was about your move. Right. And it's such a strong brand and, such, and it's great uh, recognition. But we were really recognizing we had the challenge of, of individuals or companies recognizing us for more than that. And you can spend a lot of time of that education, but and it was a part of our, our view that we would look to, to structurally change and, and uh, add the brand because we do have other suites of, of companies that are, are within the Asian Tigers family of businesses. Um, so I, I would say, you know, uh, with design thinking, uh, we may use something that may not have the exact construct of design thinking, but of talking about the ability to pivot and pivot quickly, to iterate. And we use tools like Miro or Mural, which is an online platform to leverage technology where you can put post-its and have our team members, you know, if somebody might be talking, we might have an idea of what a solution might be, but we might be a shy person culturally or as a personality that would be willing to type something and put it on the board so that then we can use a, a comparable to design thinking of find, identifying what the challenge is to then have solutions that come up from the team. And that uh, the opportunity to learn between our teams and the countries is phenomenal because we all come with a lens from what we know and being able to broaden that and even today's conversation you know, I've, I've already written a page of notes of things that I've learned from the, the, the dialogue that we've had or things that I know I want to look further into. Um, and that's really what we're looking for. So I even look at this as we could take this as being a design thinking opportunity uh, to, to where we're going as we, especially COVID, we don't have a rule book for this. This is, you know, the, the words that I really don't like overusing, it's unprecedented. It's, it's a new normal that we're living towards. This is every day of our life on hyper steroids because we just haven't re recognized the speed of change that we can actually have occur in our business, in our personal life, the way we work. I don't think any of us here would have thought that our companies would have moved to virtually working from home at the nimbleness that the organizations actually took that on because there wasn't an immediate need other than the pandemic that had, had pushed us towards that. You know, our, our industry wouldn't have shifted to that space. But anyways, I'll come back to you on, on another we, we have about uh, 11 minutes of remaining, and uh, I want to take a couple of minutes just to talk about how I was forced to uh, reinvent. Um, some of you know me a long time ago when I was in uh, uh, advertising and PR and uh, I published a print magazine. It was printed in Shenzhen and it was also printed in Seoul. Uh, it was called California Bound Relocation Guide. Print, paper, typesetting, line by line, okay? And this was back in the 80s. Early 
uh, Apple computer, uh, was in the early days there when the Mac was coming out, desktop, they saw what uh, we were doing in LA and uh, they came and gave us a Mac that says that your desktop publishing on the computer, forget about going to a typesetting shop. So uh, we tried it and it was a lifesaver and uh, enabled us to uh, put out print editions uh, for LA area, San Diego, uh, San Francisco Bay area, of course, Silicon Valley. Uh, then we did New York City and Texas and Chicago and Florida, Philadelphia, St. Louis, Arizona. Uh, all with the name Bound, US Bound was a holding company. So it was all about destination services. I didn't know what it was at the time. So um, long story short, um, that developed into an international business because the c- companies were recruiting people into these places and we sent the magazine internationally. Uh, and then it had a reply card and an 800 number for referrals and things like that. And then that led to a magazine called Corporate Relocation News to satisfy the growth of uh, international mindset. And that led to us doing our first live conference in Europe. It was November of 97 in London. Uh, Bill Grable and an old timer by the name of Jim Simpson from Victory Van Lines in New York. They were our backers, uh, and they introduced me to Frank Grace. You may remember that name from the past. And so we had, and Bill Grable came into that, and uh, and and others. Um, so that was in '97, and then we did a Paris meeting, and we partied like it was 1999, and it was. It was November of '99, and <laughs> Colgate Palmolive and. Microsoft Europe were involved. And to this day, we still have those relationships. Okay, so now we expanded global live meetings so much that uh, in uh, 2018 and 19, we produced around 40 meetings live, mostly US, but also in other places. We played to over a thousand people um, and about 40% were corporate. The rest were a variety of services providers. And our last two meetings before the shutdown were February 25 in New York City Times Square inside the accounting offices of RSM. Uh, And they invited clients and I invited contacts. We had about 100 people in the room Um, and uh, it was good. And then two days later in Washington DC on Embassy Row, uh, we had a connection uh, and we had uh, the use of a historic home of President Woodrow Wilson. Uh, and uh, was right next door to where Jeff Bezos lives, to give you an idea of the fancy neighborhood. So it was quite a place. And we had NGOs. We had uh, somebody from World Bank there. And we had all kinds of people. Uh, and it was a sellout. And that was February 27. And then I got on went to Reagan airport, got on Southwest to San Diego. And, you know, it was a big plane. I think there were 10 people, including me and the pilots and the flight attendants <laughs> on that plane. And that was the last live meeting. And where did my revenue go? It went out, done. And what am I going to do? So for a long time, I thought about doing video, but I was afraid of it. You know, when I pick my nose, scratch my head, you know, whatever. And, you know, how do I do all this? And how does it work? So producer Paul and I had been producing radio shows for 10 years. And he says, well, let's try video, you know. What do you know about Zoom? (laughs) And so we started in uh, around March 15. And since then, we've done over 50 shows. And Google Analytics, uh, if you can believe those numbers, um, they've recorded over 50,000 page views on the TV channel alone. And uh, so it's because 
we figured out how to make it comfortable and do the same thing as we did in our live meetings of have uh, good people like you guys talk spontaneously almost this is not rehearsed at all and then we make sure you all know each other using the chat room down there to exchange emails and websites uh, and please follow up if not now then i can certainly facilitate an intro later so our show today is uh, by design not publicized until this morning really because we really don't want to bother with a big crowd while doing this because this is really important. The production is really important that we do it right the first time. <laughs> One take. All right. And then uh, Paul uh, does a little snip here and there uh, of editing. And then we uh, put it up on our TV site and that links to our YouTube channel. And it's free access. Nothing to buy, nothing to sign, no obligations, 24-7, nonstop global free access. And the, we don't charge anybody. So we try to make some money by selling ad space, and that's why you saw the commercials. Okay, so our commercials are not expensive. And the power of this, and this is not a pitch, it's just so you understand the economics, is that because we put it up free of charge on our site and YouTube and then promote it out uh, through social media and our direct sends, uh, we guarantee to the advertiser and to people like yourselves, 12 month exposure free worldwide. And so that's called marketing, okay? And so it's the reincarnation, the reinventing of the old magazine days, print, you know, page by page, line by line into what we're doing right now. So JD, how many, I mean, what, what's your goal? What's your objective with HRCI for the new year? So definitely uh, continue the international expansion because we do see that many of the emerging markets, particularly in Southeast Asia, Latin America, uh, the HR profession is finally becoming what we all have known to be, which is uh, something essential for uh, companies, for uh, businesses to succeed. Right. And people for economy. It's all yeah, about and people. Right. Exactly. For economies to, to be stable. So uh, our experience over the last 40 years has been mostly within the United States, but now we're evolving to a total different level. However, the certifications and the, the best practices that we've learned over those, uh, those decades can be still implemented in some of these emerging markets. So the intention is to go to those markets, learn uh, what is the need, uh, make sure that we adjust to the culture, to the, to the reality of uh, each, uh, each market, each region, and, uh, and help out, uh, connect with HR associations, connect with governments and build together something that defines the profession of the future in HR. Yeah, Pri, are you, is, is Helma involved in Brazil, Latin America? So we don't have an office there yet, but we work there with partners, uh, with uh, premier destination, so Carla, and um, yes, that's that's uh, that's our model where where we don't have offices. So we set up a network of reliable uh, partners across the globe. Yeah, that's great. So is is Gislaine still involved in Helma? Yes, Gislaine is the CEO and founder. Yes. Yeah, and he's in Paris, right? Yes, that's correct. Yeah, that's great. Well, we should do one of these with him in Paris someday. So Kay, thanks very much for for orchestrating your end of this and uh, introducing JD, it's great. And, and Kay, um, Asian Tigers, uh, now this is a public company now, isn't it? No, 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 it's still privately held, the same oh, shareholders. Um, so uh, yeah, it's private, it's a group of entrepreneurs that uh, were like-minded trading partners for many, many years ago. Our oldest company, I think is 57 years old. Um, and I'll, as the clock ticks on, it's one year older than uh, Singapore is a nation. Um, and that's the entity that's based out of Singapore. Uh, so no, it's, we're not a privately held company or not, we're not a publicly held company. We're, we're absolutely private. And I have, it's a group of, of 
uh, gentlemen family businesses that are together uh, uh, as Asian tigers. Uh, and Silk Relo is the same investors. Um, it, so no, it's not 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 public. So uh, it must be pretty exciting for you and Beverly in particular uh, for this new um, Asia, Trans-Asia uh, trade pack. Uh, Very exciting. Yeah. Yes. So, countries and, and yeah, Beverly, why don't you explain a little bit about this exciting thing? There is now a, a trade Asian trade pack here where you have 15 countries within Asia which have come to an agreement to uh, be rid of tariffs and to have free trade. And I think it's an important enhancement for Asia. It's led by China and I can only see the strength in the area. Uh, and it's exciting for us being in Hong Kong because we're in the center of much of this. And I think it will help stimulate growth. I think it will bring good trade practices that are globally founded um, for the entire area. So for us, I, I'm most excited. I would also like to say, by the way, thank you, Ed, for putting this together. Um, you know, the technology from paper uh, to, to text, now to videos and Zoom being one of the vehicles, I think has been extremely important for ourselves not only in being able to communicate, but during this pandemic, um, where you have people who are stranded, who are isolated, who quarantine, who go through depression, and who are anxious. And the means in which we are able to enter the room and support people has really changed and, and gives us the agility. So I see that as part of the design um, feature that we do now, and and I can only see that these tools will enhance relationships. So it's really interesting. Yes, yesterday uh, I I secured um, on the, along the same thinking. Uh, I, I secured a, a participant uh, in a broadcast I'm going to be doing tomorrow, uh, focusing in on California. Uh, so when I relocated myself and my business idea from Boston to LA in, a long time ago in 1979 um, to found California Bound. That was a spinoff from my Boston publication, which I called Settling In Greater Boston, which was the same idea. It was used by the high tech companies and some of the colleges like Harvard and MIT uh, for recruiting. Uh, so in the California of those days, everybody wanted to move to California, you know, it was not only because of the song California Dreaming by the Mamas and the Puppets, but um, it was the thing to do. So uh, now companies are leaving California for Texas and Arizona and Las Vegas and who knows. And so here I am, I'm still here. So. Um, I'm putting together a California bound program that will attempt to bring together recruiters, headhunters, corporate managers, relocation people in a talk show like this. And it's going to be tomorrow at 9 a.m. California time. Uh, and it's about what companies and people can do to think about, to design think how are we going to solve this tax problem that is growing, <laughs> not going away in California? It's getting very expensive to live here. Real estate prices are, keep going up because I don't, it's the pandemic is causing the real estate business to boom. And there's not enough inventory and the prices keep going up. So it's like great if you own property, and, but people who don't own now, It'd be really, really hard for them to stay in California. And so, and they're going to leave, you know, they're going to go to other places where there's less taxes and lower cost housing and where companies are going because they can't bring people into California. So um, what are we going to do about this? So the idea of the talk show tomorrow is that, uh, yeah, Boston University. That's cool. Uh, yeah, Beverly. <laughs> it was right down the street from where I lived in Brookline. 
so uh, yeah <laughs> so uh the california bound show it will be recorded and then will be distributed so uh paul falcone who used to be the head of hr for Paramount Pictures and used our California Bound magazine in 1980. He and I have stayed in touch and he was a recent video interview with me about a month ago. And so I invited him to come back on the show and talk about the, re old, the old days of recruiting and now what are we gonna do in the new? And he says, no, no, I'm not gonna do that. I'm not in recruitment anymore, but let me introduce you to a couple of people. All right. So he introduced me to this guy by the name of Gary, uh, Gary who was an executive headhunter based in L.A. And he's going to come on the show, just to give you an idea, and talk about some of the contracts that he has right now looking to recruit open positions in L.A. area companies uh, in the 200000 to 300000 a year salary plus benefits, all right? And some of the issues they're having uh, in recruiting high-priced talent into the market. He's gonna be talking about solutions as well as the issues. Uh, and then also on the program is the Global VP HR, CHRO of uh, a nutrition company called Herbalife. I think you may have heard of that, or Herbalife Nutrition Worldwide. Anyway, Kim is coming on the show also and bringing with her her mobility manager, in-house mobility manager, to talk about their issues. And then also on the program is Teresa. And Teresa and I met in 1980 in L.A. when she was the in-house realtor relocation director for a company called John Douglas which was a white shoe first class operation at the time in LA. And I mean, really the, the top society people. Anyway, I did a cold call in Beverly Hills on the John Douglas company. I knocked on the door and walked in. I was wearing a tie at the time. And I asked to speak to the relocation director. And so I was shown the door, not that door, but that door <laughs> and uh, uh, we had a conversation and you know what they bought ads on the spot and because of the new idea of a recruitment guide called California Bound and so uh, and then she introduced me to some of her society realtor friends in other cities around LA because they're all territorial and uh, they all bought also. So our California Bound magazine was launched when interest rates, home interest rates were like 18% because mm -hmm. of a recession at the time. And the only people who could afford to buy a home were corporate relocations because they had a guaranteed job and the mortgage people had no risk and the realtors loved it. And so we had this perfect storm of success uh, on the California bound. Anyway, Teresa Howe and I have remained in contact. And so she's coming on the show now, tomorrow, the California bound show. She's now a consultant and helps realtors build their relocation offices. And she's going to be talking about what she's doing now and what she sees. So it's taking the old and bringing it forward using today's technology and that is the reinvention uh, that I think all of us are now playing with or our way around. It's like the blind people touching the elephant. You know, you're not sure what you're touching. Uh, and that's how I feel about all this. And I want to thank you all for listening and participating in this broadcast. I think it's going to be a really popular show throughout the year as we promote it around the world. And Pre, thank you very much for your support and your deep dive here on design thinking. Carla, it's great to have you involved and we'll talk further about our Brazil meeting. Beverly, again, hugs and thank you. And uh, Kay, 
that's uh i think we last time we were together we danced at erc right yes probably i, I think it was one <laughs> of those <laughs> all right so jd nice to meet you and thanks for you very much and Same sayonara and yeah. ciao bye bye thank you thank all. you thank you everyone have a good day thank okay, you bye, bye. Thank you for joining us in the meeting room at Global TV Talk Show. Have a wonderful day, and stay safe.